Hyphen Labs is here to present their work, Neurospeculative Afrofeminism. Thank you so much. We're so excited to be here. Um, this is our second day. And um, I'm Ash. I'm Carmen. I'm Edger. And we are Hyphen Labs. <laughs> so today we're going to talk a little bit about our most recent work called yeah. Neurospeculative Afrofeminism. Um, it's a four-part project that we <coughs> developed last year and debuted at the 2017 Sundance Film Festival. And then we went on to show it at a number of other festivals. Um, and we're continuing to show it. But uh, this is a little bit of an introduction to our work and an entry point into talking about what we hope to develop through our residency here this year. So we wanted to make a project that looked at a community um, and oriented it within the realm of emerging technology, uh, immersive experiences, <coughs> digital art, neuroscience, uh, cognitive science, literature, kind of you know this, this point where we could explore our various interests but question uh, what are the roles, contributions, uh, and responsibilities of black women in these different fields because we, um, you know, we wanted to challenge what work is being done in the space. Um, so it started with us, you know, asking the question of where are all the black women in neuroscience? So also just in our, our respective fields. Like my background is in molecular biology. Um, Carmen is a structural engineer. Ajay is an architect. And you know, in our, in our collective experiences, we didn't see many women who looked like us. Um, and, and we were looking for mentors, looking for people who were just, you know, maybe just passing down the hallway that kind of we could connect with. And there was that visibility, but it wasn't there. So we wanted to see if, if digital technology could be an intervention point for, you know, younger women. Um, and so this is kind of like a, a project for our younger selves, we like to call it. Um, so we told the story through speculative products, uh, a virtual reality experience, and then scientific research. So the idea is that um, we put you in, in a, a, a hair salon called the Neurocosmetology Lab, which is a reimagined hair salon. And you think you're going there to get your hair done, but you're really going to get your brain optimized. And uh, we, we created these roster of products that live in both the, the physical and the digital. Um, that tie back into the story. So the VR um, is one of the narrative drivers is one of the products that we created. I'm gonna kinda go in order of, of the slides, so I'll present those products to you first. So here's a rendering of them. Um, there are five of them and they really speak to ideas of security, protection, surveillance, and visibility uh, related to black hair care and beauty rituals. So taking something that is familiar and recontextualizing it through technology. So the first, um, the first product that started this project uh, was a transparent sunscreen. So we started this project in 2016, in the summer of 2016, which we call the bloody summer. Um, it was in July. Uh, two unarmed black men were murdered within a few days of each other. Uh, Carmen and I were living together in New York, and I was working a very corporate job. She was at the School for Poetic Computation, and we didn't really feel like we had a space to talk about how this was impacting us. Um, and it was kind of the punctuation on the end of a very long sentence of, of this happening over and over and over again, and these images being represented through media. Um, and we wanted to talk about, you know, like what that meant for us as women of color, uh, what it meant for us being citizens in the world and how we could drive conversation around why is this happening and what, what, is, what can we do to intervene. Um, so we implemented these self-care weekends where, you know, we wanted to go to various locations in New York um, and one of them was Storm King. I don't know how, if you guys have ever been there, but it was a really hot summer day and I bought some sunscreen to put on and when I put it on, it discolored me. Like it turned, it like gave me this sort of like ashy complexion. And it, so often we have these products that, you know, the design isn't meant 
for a wide demographic of people. And something like that that, you know, could be looked at and, and figured out through like having a wider s test set or something, you know, we wanted to figure out a solution for that. So it started with the sunscreen. Um, and here is a, this is like our, our uh, prototype of it. And this is um, it on display at Sundance. So um, we have a physical installation <coughs> where we have all of these products on display. So that was what it looks like. And then, um, so the next product that we wanted to create was uh, is something called ScatterViz, and this is a collaboration with a um, fashion designer, AB Screenwear, uh, to uh, and to create the actual object. And we wanted to create a visor that also mirrored the visors that we wear in VR and could deflect microaggressions um, in reality. Also, thinking about what kind of safe spaces are we going to need in these virtual worlds, in the online worlds, and how can we protect ourselves from um, and like create filters around ourselves. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we don't get into the uncanny valley. This was a very um, low budget um, prototype and project, so we weren't able to achieve any of the micro movements um, and like facial movements that uh, you can get with big budget projects. So in order to make sure that we had something that was understandable, we put, placed these visors over our characters in VR. Um. And the nature of the material is that when you put it on, you can, the, the wearer can see out but the person that you're looking at can't see in. So it's a symbolic representation of microaggressions, where if someone's saying something to you that, that doesn't make you feel good, you put the visor down and they're faced with the reflection of themselves. So they're essentially looking at themselves in the mirror. Um, next we uh, <coughs> is a reimagination of a technology that exists called transcranial stimulation. Um, and this is kind of an, an interesting technology in the biohacking and quantified self community. The, the use for this is, you know, through neurobiology is uh, intervention for pain that can't be um, treated using pharmaceutical interventions or, or deep depression. But people in the quantified self movement and biohacking communities are using it as a way of like optimizing themselves, you know, like giving a little jolt to your brain and that to help you get into flow states faster or to enhance your, uh, enhance your learning. Your, exactly. So we wanted to open up the conversation of like, how can I use this thing with, you know, I have a lot of hair, people who have curly hair, um, how can they easily integrate this technology into their day to day if they also wanted to figure out how to hack their neurobiology. Um, so we had the idea of embedding these um, these sensors, these electrodes into hair extensions <coughs> and really like honing back to African hair braiding techniques. Um, so that is what you're going through when you go into our neurocosmetology lab. So we obviously didn't want to physically do this so we simulated this experience through VR. So um, this is the first of what we hope to be, you know, a, a long line of episodic content targeting different regions of the brain. Um, so the idea is that w uh, you would go through a different experience depending on what region of the brain we tell you that we're targeting. So this is a rendering of what they look like. And then here's our physical representation of them. The fourth one is a uh uh, what we call a ruby cam. It's an audio and uh, video embedded earrings that are inspired by uh, gold door knocker earrings. Um, uh, what we wanted to do is to uh, hand <coughs> people with a tool where they can, uh, where they have the agency to kind of record uh, any, let's say, violent, I don't know, police interactions that they have. Because we realize that when you're in these types of situations when you take out your phone outside, it's all it's seen as a weapon. So I want to like embed this, uh, I don't know, uh, te um, this technology to a daily object 
or all, the only thing you have to do is just to press the button and then hopefully send it to a cloud server where people can access what's going on, what's happening to you in real time. Mm -hmm. And this is how it looks like. Well, all of these products are very low budget, but they're all functioning products. And this was a yeah, this was in display on Sundance. Next one. Mm -hmm. And the last product is called Hyperface. It's a um, it's a, a kind of like a camouflage tool, which confuses computer vision algorithms. This particular scarf has uh, 1,200 faces, and when I'm wearing it, um, in the the pattern has a higher confidence level than my face, so the uh, cameras can are, will be detecting the faces on the scarf rather than my face. And we were speculating about how we can use this technology, where are the places we can use this. First of all, to be uh, invisible when we don't want to, when we don't want to be visible. Let's say the second one was to. Let's say when we're in a like a large uh, protest, if like everyone is wearing this, it can uh, ultimately uh, break, let's say the tracking system, overloading the system with millions of uh, faces. And the third one is if we can uh, somehow dilute the libraries of faces so that it, they all become like very, uh, what's that word? Um, the only face that they're seeing is going to be this particular pattern, so they stop detecting other faces. Also, just um, from a historical perspective, <coughs> the scarf represents the Tillon laws. Um, you know, in Jim Crow South, black women were required to wear scarves on their heads as a way of identifying themselves. Um, and we wanted to think about the divide between making the visible uh, visible or the invisible visible and taking back a tool that was meant for surveillance and make it a, making it a counter surveillance tool. So the next part um, that we developed was the VR experience and during our experience at Sundance we put three p and at um, the other festivals we put um, multiple people in this scenario where as a user, you embody a young woman and meet the owner and uh, director and inventor, Brooks, of the Neurocosmetology Lab. You interact with um, another participant, and we'll show you in a teaser kind of what the uh, stylistic elements are, some of the characters, um, and you go for a brain optimization session. and. Um, uh, here is the uh, main character that you embody and with the headset uh, we're using uh, Oculus Rift and it's a room scale setup which um, but we actually put you in a salon chair and so you can swivel around in the chair and um, you can move your head side to side and we use a mirror so you can see your reflection as this young girl and when you go through this optimization session, you enter a fu uh, future scape or um, you know an optimization space rea or reality, and you lose your body. And so you fly through this world, and then you meet three deities um, who have a message for you, and um, and that is a uh, an empowering message that when you come back to the salon, you meet Brooks and um, you feel somewhat optimized. Uh, so basically simulating what this transcranial stimulation uh, technology could do without actually impacting uh, your brain. This is a, an image of how we set up the VR experience. Um, we have a three-part uh, space, the first part being a gift shop where you can interact with and um, touch the products. The second part being the salon, which is three chairs, three mirrors, three headsets, and then the third part being the brain lab. Um, just kind of a setup of what this looks like. And um, we have different characters. So we're starting to introduce also, you know, black women as avatars. We were looking for 
black women as representations on um, 3D software library rep websites like TurboSquid, and um, we really couldn't find anything that wasn't stereotypical. So we decided that we had to make our own because we didn't want other people to define what the characters in our story were going to be. Um, and we wanted to ground this VR experience in a space, um, in a salon, which has typically been a space for social and political activation. Um, has been a, it's been a safe space, and it's also um, a space for ritual, um, for hair care and self care. Um, but why not subvert the, the I, the theme of the hair salon and create a brain salon. Um, and so this is the the other world that you enter, which is a place with the rescaled and recontexted um, objects that you meet in reality. Um, the scarf is the flag of the world. The earring is kind of scanning the world. There's TVs and um, like antennas that are glitching and there's hands coming out of them um, representing the like misinformation that we're receiving about our world. Um, and then these are kind of electrodes that are falling from the sky. And then in this temple you meet these like three characters. And so we made this as <coughs> a way of doing research. So we wanted to do cognitive impact research to extend what has already been done around neuroscience and virtual reality and representation. Um, we wanted to see if VR can be a tool for decreasing perceptual bias um, and, um, and figure out how storytelling fits into that. Um, so we did a research pilot at Sundance and South by Southwest where we um, tested participants. We, we gave them an implicit association test both before and after um, going through the virtual reality. And then we, f we followed it up with a longer form demographic survey to see what you know role diversity plays in their home life uh, in their job, um, how much exposure they've had to black women in positions of power, um, et cetera. And we are in the process of, of um, submitting a paper about the results that we found, but we would like to understand how emerging media is changing the way that we engage uh, with different groups um, and seeing if that embodying someone in a body that is not the same uh, ethnicity as themselves, if that has any sort of impact of giving them a touch point of, of you know, engaging with those groups in a different way in real life. Um, so yeah. That's it. We had a super diverse team. Um, we, you know, a lot of the objects we collaborated with different people, the earring we collaborated with Michelle Cortez and the scarf we collaborated with Adam Harvey. Um, Todd Bryant and Laj and Halime were helping us a lot with uh, the 3D along with Anwar. Um, and so this was our first project in virtual reality. We've done large scale installations before and we've, we're familiar with um, emerging tech and um, like design, but we've never really done any narrative uh, VR um, experiences. So this is kind of a, to show you what the team looked like and how we, we created it, so. It, another thing too is like, we have a very global team. Um, and we did this because, you know, we wanted to talk about this thing that's impacting all of us. Um, it's <laughs> not just, you know, a, a black narrative or it's not just something that you can only engage with through this like framework of blackness. This was like project-based learning for us to understand and appreciate, you know, a perspective that is different than our own. So it was, a, it was really fun to kind of like work on this with a global team. Um, and, and so now we'll show you kind of a teaser of what the VR experience is like.
Thank you. Now, are there, of course, it's, it's you've seen it's project-based, it's an installation, it's uh, objects, not why I'm saying project, it's object-based, it's an installation, it's a VR experience, it's also part one of perhaps three. So there's a lot to discuss. Any questions first off? Uh, would you be able to give us any preliminary results from the research that you did? Yeah, so we do see that there is some sort of decrease like from the baseline that we um, found in the IAT data. Uh, we don't know what the long-term effects of, of Th that research is yet. Um, it's something that we're trying to build into the next experience and also figuring out what an impactful control for this sort of thing would be. You know, like, do we, is this our, our control experience and then the next one, are you able to choose what avatar you embody or do if we choose a different avatar for you, will you also, like, have some sort of um, lasting impact on, on your um, perceptual bias? So that's kind of where we're at, we're at right now. Um, but yeah, we do. We have seen some interesting, like statistically significant results from it. Uh, first of all, I am so glad to have you here. That you exist. <laughs> so, so I, it's a long story. I just <laughs> delighted that you're here. A um, couple of things, comments. Um, first of all, I would like to recommend you. A friend of mine is running the the Hack for Inclusion. You're probably going to be here. Until Thursday. As residents? Uh, until as residents? Oh, yes. as re oh, for the next year. Oh, the next year. Okay, very good. Well, then there are several things going on. There's an event going on uh, at Microsoft Nerd, which is right next to the Sloan School, right here. Um, a hacking for discrimination. Um, even though it's more for business related things, some of the issues that you're bringing up are definitely you know, involved with it. So I recommend it. It's March 9th and 10th. Okay. So yes, right here. So the MIT alumna is running it. Right. Okay. okay. So I'm sure you can find some fellow fellow individuals. Um, also, um, on a more personal note, how did you come into one of the issues I have is as a STEM education advocate and also as an AR developer is trying to get more people, more minorities, more women into this field, this area. Is it, um, is it sort of like a, a happenstance that you got into it, or because you, know, you have very, very different backgrounds? Or what made you, how did you teach yourself how to develop it? One of the things I have to deal with, the people have remarkable stories, but they do not know how to do technology, you know, technologically develop these, these particular projects. How did you get into it? Eje and I went to school in, um, in, in took an interaction design master's course and advanced architecture course. And so we were exposed to a lot of um, new ideas in terms of programming, which we had, and like generative design, which we didn't really have much knowledge about. And um, this was in 2014, so there weren't really any public facing VR headsets yet, but we got to try, what was that, um, what, the, um, where, to be another? Machine to be the another. machine to be another. And so we got to try some really interesting VR experiences and we kept telling ourselves like, let's create work in, in VR. And she was really pushing us to uh, explore that medium. And when Ashley and I were like over the summer thinking about these objects, we knew we had to embed technology in them in, in order to protect the communities um, that were being affected by these tragedies, mm -hmm. um, as well as come up with like clever low tech ways to counter technology. Um, and you know, we don't necessarily know how to program everything. We don't know how to um, make some technical decisions, but we aren't afraid of asking and reaching out to the people that do in order to make it accessible to ourselves. Um, so we make sure, and 
you know, we, we partner with people that also care about the, um, the project because they are advocates of STEM and STEAM for, you know, e like underrepresented youth as mm -hmm. well. Um, so we, we have a lot of partners that really feel empowered by the story coming from, you know, diverse backgrounds such as ours. And I think that they're also very helpful um, in like actually creating the elements. Um, but we do a lot of the research about how to visualize things, how to build the spaces um, ourselves, and then behavioral uh, and kinetic technological implementations. We, whenever we need to, we reach out to those who know better than, than we do. Also, um, I'm a, a molecular biologist, so you know that's kind of how I fit into the research aspect of it. But I've always been really interested in neuroscience and how technology can drive some of the tools that are used in cognitive science. Um, and I've been interested in VR for a long time, but I didn't have the technical know-how. So you know, Carmen and I have been friends for almost 14 years, and like. I wanted to go to a school in Berlin called the Mind and Brain Institute, uh, mm -hmm, specifically yeah. for VR. But it was kind of before it be, it became it like 2011. yeah, this like resurgent thing. So mm -hmm. there, like, no one had access to a headset. Uh, no one like the tools weren't there. And I applied with this like abstract idea of like this VR thing that I wanted to do. Um, and Carmen's like, why don't we just do it? You know, mm -hmm. and like here we are four years later so, the tools were available and they were accessible to us, so we did it um, outside of this like academic framework, so we were able to be a little more experimental and like, DIY in the way that we did it. Um, and it was also that Winslow lent us this computer. Yeah, we had a friend who like lent us a computer and a headset because we couldn't afford it at first. Um, and so like, we also had a residency at New Inc. Uh, in New York, it's the tech um, incubator that was founded and like funded by the new museum. So mm -hmm. there were other people there working on VR. So you know our desk mates w were also in the same field and doing the same thing. So we just asked a lot of questions and we were very open to receiving you know the knowledge that they had to share with us. You also had a particular approach to that team. So when you're saying you've outreached, I think the way you did it is inspirational too. If people out there don't have the means to create something, uh, you build a very diverse team just by approaching them one on one. So how is that type of collaboration? Because it does become kind of a, a huge group. You, you've just explained part of it too, like working with people who cared about this. Yeah. But I don't think you have uh, part of the backstory you explained uh, to students yesterday was just the fact that most of these people did the work for free. Yeah, yeah. so we, we started off with no money. Like, we had a deadline. We didn't know how we were going to do it, but we just, like, we were hustling for three months to find funding. Um, and we knew that we had to build <coughs> in tandem to finding money. So, like, we reached out to a lot of people on social media. Like, we're... I mean, we're always on Instagram. That's like where we find our visual inspiration. And like we would reach out to people and say, hey, we have this amazing project. We love your work. We don't have any money. We don't know like if this is something that you would be interested in doing for free. And when we find money, we will pay you. Um, and most people were like, yeah, like I, like at the, at the time it was just a deck and an idea. And they were like, I don't know what you're talking about, but it looks cool. It sounds cool. Like how can we help? Um, so that went on and then the last day of 2016, we um, Carmen met uh, someone from Intel at a maker fair, and you know we were in pitch mode. Like anybody that would pass us on the street, we we're like, "Hey, we are, we're doing this thing. Like, we don't have any money. We don't know how we're going to do it, but you know we want to apply to Sundance and X Y Z." Um, and so a bunch of people got in a room and they listened to us and we got funding from them. Um, and so we were able to then pay all the people that agreed to do this work for us because they loved the idea, they loved what impact we were trying to have. Um, and then we were able to buy our hardware, our equipment and get us there. Um, 
so yeah, it's, it's persistence. It's like not, it's like believing in your idea so much that you will try to move mountains to make it happen, uh, even if you don't have the resources. Like we also had to take out a loan just to do motion capture because that was like the standstill that we couldn't get past. Like nothing else could happen in, until we did motion capture. Um, so we did that and we were like, okay, well like, uh, we'll try to, if we, if we have to like leave and like go back to work to pay this off, then I guess that's what we'll have to do. But like we fortunately, uh, we're able to, to get the money. And there's next steps coming down the pipe too. So mm -hmm. uh, your, <coughs> what's your plan for the year to come? Because you have, you know, uh, that was phase one. Or so could, should we call it? Can we call it phase one? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so what are the next phases in, in your planning? We just started that. Yeah, <laughs> so we're, we're, we're <laughs> like, but that's what we're developing sure. now. Yeah. I mean, we want to, you know, this is the prototype, and we've got such, we've gotten such a positive response, and um, that we've gotten a lot of interest for another roster of objects, um, as well as more VR, um, maybe as episodic. Uh, we want to push. The VR to and like look at what multi-sensory or social what a social experience would would look like um, and then also with um, a larger feature film narrative um, talking about empowering young women of color in STEM um, and also we're um, and getting to work with the synthetic neurobiology department here so taking these like very high level biological and technological concepts and making them accessible for people through narrative and giving them something <coughs> to kind of like latch on to um, and tying some of these exciting new technologies in, in brain science into the products or the objects that we're developing. Um, and what else? Any more questions? Yeah, sure. So, so it sounds like you inhabit a space that's part activist, part design-centric art, art and art intervention. Um, and I can imagine these things that you're doing can go in lots of different ways. They can sort of stay in the exhibition world, or they could maybe go out and be products that are both products that people with dark skin can probably use uh, uh, you know, uh, sun protection that, that isn't going to turn them gray. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it can also be used to raise consciousness. Are you thinking about those kinds of expansions, or does this stay under the glass Sure. Definitely. We want to make these into design provocations to encourage companies, designers, etc., to really think about the people who inhabit this world and who they're creating for and circumvent some of these biases that are built into objects, products, etc. Um, and uh, not necessarily taking this to market per se, you know, but like giving people the tools to make them themselves. You know, like, we, we're all designers. We all have the internet, which is probably the, the most powerful tool to learn how to do something. Um, and, you know, we did this in, the whole thing we did in like six months, but actually making like the, the VR, we did in six weeks. So like, if you have laser focus, you can accomplish like a lot of things. Um, so that's what our goal is. Right now, the objects are living in the galleries and exhibition world because that's where they're having the most impact, but our long-term goal is to put them out into the world and like have people modify them for, for themselves. And also create the like structure around the design thinking of human-centered design rather than profit-driven design. I know there's also people interested in the research done on VR or the impacts of VR. Uh, VR was labeled for some time, especially in 2015, as the empathy machine, and that made headlines. And then a lot of VR experiences in 2016 tried to either uh, explore that narrative, could it really be used as a new way to bring new ways of thinking? And more and more, there's a lot of question marks. Should we explore this? Should we do research? to evaluate some of this impact of what we're showing in this medium. Uh, and you guys are also adding that to the place, not just 
these objects that are in themselves uh, kind of stimulators of conversations and uh, helps awaken a, certain thoughts and reflections on on surveillance, on uh, discrimination, on dis disrupting the tools <coughs> for other purposes. So I think that is also already a conversation maker. But the research itself that you want to add on could be a conversation maker itself. Can you talk a little bit more about the research aspect? Um, yeah. Uh, I guess in what way? Well, um, so just you're exploring the research also on how the, I'm sorry because I'm forgetting the terminology, but you're evaluating pre-bias mm -hmm. of, uh, of the participants or yeah. the visitors like of the space and then afterwards. How does the, how does the research work on that? Yeah, figuring out what representation means. Um, a lot of groups have shown that if you embody someone in an avatar and then show them a reflection of themselves in some way and like have movement, um, which is like grounding them in the body and showing them th that they have agency over this body, then that adds a, adds a layer of immersion and presence. Um, and so we want to play with that and, and see whether or not like a person has a baseline level of bias, which we've you know elucidated through the IAT, if they are then embodied in, in a black avatar, um, which is shown to have the most impact if that then changes the way that they engage with this community outside of the virtual sense. Um, and then also like telling a culturally specific narrative, if that narrative then adds another deeper layer of understanding. Because I, you know, if you think about film uh, and, and media, the images that you're shown about different groups is really impactful because for a lot of people that is the only touch point that they have for diversity is the images that they see on the screen. So, you know, how can we use something where you, we have your undivided attention for however long the experience is to, to feed you something that refutes that. Um, and so the pilot that we worked on was, you know, really coming at it from more of a social psychological perspective, but we want to see if, like, we can actually do, like, brain imaging to see, like, what regions of the brain are, are lighting up, what, um, you know. I think also to further to your question, I think one of the reasons you came here was to partner with scientific yeah. uh, researchers and, and narrativize and design around that. Right. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the research here that's going on that you're going to be working with? Yeah. Um, well, we've just been recently meeting with different scientists from like the Synthetic Neurobiology Lab um, to the Open Doc Lab, who are also integrating like sensors um, into VR or installation experiences, um, and I think also understanding that you're creating new memories when you're making and experiencing VR because it's not a passive experience. So rather, so the research changes when you have a passive experience to when you have an active experience because you can trick your mind to believe that you're simulated in an experience with others that you may not engage with on an everyday uh, basis. So, and um, so we're seeing like how can, you know, what parts of the brain or what parts and, and how are, activated and then how can we understand that and then how can we correlate some of our emotional <coughs> and physiological responses to the you know decisions that we make um, and then how is that visualized or understood in an installation context as oneself or as outside viewers of people who are doing the experience or, or um, partaking in the research. Um, also like doing a bio-adaptive feedback. Um, so people who are in VR, you know, impacting what people who are waiting to go into the experience are hearing or seeing or feeling um, through sensors that are, you know, Im embedded in some way um, 
while you're doing VR and also thinking about like that pre-assessment, that pre-game. Like can you prime people to be more open and receptive to what they're going to see when they put the headset on? So we're very interested in the physical space as well and how that adds a layer of immersion. Um, and, and also opening up the idea of, of research and um, the research that we had, that has been fed to us through uh, the Nielsen report or psychology today says like Latina women are this or black women are this, um, but it really isn't imp necessarily empowering um, to ourselves or our communities. So how could we create research around a new narrative that just looks at you know our responses and rather than trying to take an analytical approach of then pigeonholing this entire group of people in you know a, in a certain way um, how can we just start to understand what's happening because that research hasn't really there it hasn't been done um, so that's where we wanted to that's where we started I guess was like what does it look like when we when we hear Michelle Obama speak um, what what parts of my brain or your brain or your brain um, like activates and how can we create an empowering experience and <coughs> like without looking at gender or race or age how can we see what the difference is in our brain activity um, and, and how does that affect us and is it positive is it I mean just what is it in general and are there models so you mentioned earlier the machine to be another and there's some people involved in that project here that we'll have to be sure you connect with but that was a very intensively studied uh, project and are there are there other projects like that that you're looking at in terms of research methodologies either to be inspired by or to stay away from or to hack in some way? I mean, we've been using Becoming Homeless yeah. um, as a example of bringing research into the public sphere, mm -hmm. which was another element of our research that we wanted to <coughs> um, develop because a lot of the prejudice and bias research that's done is stuck kind of inside academia. And so by bringing it to festivals, film festivals, we were able to reach a new demographic of people. And um, so the research that's coming out of Stanford by the... Yeah. Um, they, they were, you know, attempting to approach research inside the headset. And um, so that's one place that we got to experience it. There's also, um, you know, we're working with Danielle Olson um, and Fox Harrell and the enemy with the pre, um, pre module like assessments and um, kind of understanding what, what are people doing when they're trying to understand who you are and how that affects your simulation. Um, like there's storytelling you know we got to do a lot of VR at the festivals that we went to so we um, there were a lot of people there who are you know our peers that <coughs> we looked to what they're doing and how their how narrative works in their experiences um, to tell our story like I was really impacted by Dear Angelica um, also what was Gobbo's piece called the, the last goodbye um, notes on blindness um, there like there's a lot of really interesting VR out there and, and like that's the thing like we just have to be exposed to a lot of it and do a lot of it to really understand what it means to tell a story in, in 360 degrees and like use spatial cues and, and, and uh, dialogue in a way that's very different than uh, on a screen you actually had a great way of uh of storyboarding or prototyping, which I thought was inspirational. You know, uh, Vincent McCurley from the National Film Board of Canada in uh, Vancouver did just this disc with a little tiny drawing of a character. It's just a disc, it's just the drawing of a circle and a character inside it. 
but people are so hungry for ways of thinking differently about how to imagine this space that we're all using it, it's shared widely. You had a very different strategy in an original one. I thought, hey, let's get inspired by that too. So how, how did you think about space and what was happening inside the VR space? Well, we turned our apartment into like our set and we did role playing um, before we did motion capture and while we were doing the storyboard. So I was the main character, Carmen <laughs> was the VR participant. Um, and then we acted it out. And then we, we all work remotely. It was just like kind of a divine intervention that we were living together for a year. But now Carmen lives in London. Uh, I live in New York. And Ejay lives in Barcelona. So after we did this, we called up Ejay on Skype. And we did it for her. You know, like we, um, we acted it out over and over again. Um, and then we really thought about how. Until we hit something yeah. that was like, OK, this is what we, this is the message we want to take away. This is the experience we want to have. Um, so it's like very theatrical. You know, yeah. Carmen is like our actor. She's like in theater. She knows how to be emotive. So she's able to draw that out in all of us, too. So uh, we all come with like very different backgrounds. You know, like I, I'm able to synthesize a feeling <coughs> and write it and put it into words and like really hone in the script. Ej takes, you know, our ideas and visually translates it um, and then you know, Carmen ties it all together and, and you know, we, we are able to create this thing that we did through co-creation and collaboration. Awesome. Any more questions? Uh, I would like to hear more about, because you mentioned before, this idea of the physical experience, uh, not only through the headset, but also through the whole installation, the setup that you feel up. I think that, that this is something that will be more present in the VR festivals and experience and I wonder what, if you want to share some thoughts about why you decided to do it in that way using an installation and, and uh, as far as you have seen other projects maybe we can just think more in a more general way why we are like designing this kind of experience outside the, the, the headsets. Uh, well, <coughs> while, we were, uh, while we were in New York in New Ink, sorry. Uh, we had the chance to go to a lot of uh, festivals to see VR and what people were doing because it was still very new to us. And each time we went to these places, they were like these black cubes, and you would enter them, just put that set on, <coughs> that you would be just transported to somewhere else. And that, in a way, wasn't working for me personally. And we wanted to uh, kind of, how was that word? To um, put them or, or prime people <coughs> in before so that they uh, once they put the headset on they can so we create this hair salon and once they once they put the headset they will be in the same space to uh, easily immerse in this type of uh, landscape let's say not to just have a I don't know like a cut from the real life but more like a, a mixed a you know a parallel mixed experience with and we were wearing lab coats and <coughs> acting like the characters in the VR too and would we'll tell them, you're on time for your appointment, please take a seat, now you'll be uh, going through your brain treatment or brain optimization uh, session. And I think it really helped. Um, it's like kind of like immersive theater, like as a bridge, as a bridge to virtual reality because I do think that if this is your first time doing VR, you don't really, a lot of people didn't know what to do. You know, they didn't know how, they didn't know how to move in the headset. They didn't know what was expected of them. Like a lot of people were just like s facing <coughs> forward. And if you, if, you, if you enter a space that looks like the space that you see in VR, that could make you feel a little more comfortable. So we just wanted, we wanted our audience to have a sense of comfort because that's what this experience is all about. You know, we weren't trying to, make them be afraid or uh, make something too unknown because then you're outside of, you know, this, this zone of learning, you know, if, you, if, if you're too afraid. Also, um, we're seeing that real life is affected by digital experiences um, with SWAT teams showing up to <coughs> gamers' houses or, um, like, the way that 
you interact with your neighbors because of how they're posting through social media. You know, our real lives are being affected. And so we really can't, and we won't be divorcing the two realities, um, whether the virtual reality is a simulation or, um, and especially as like technology becomes more seamless, it'll be more integrated. So we, we wanted to blur that definition between where you end up in real life and where you end up in digital life is act can actually be the same and you can get the same meaning from mm -hmm. both places. It's just who are you, who, whose stories are you listening to in each reality and who's, um, who's affecting you. And uh, so we wanted, I mean, as, as AJ is saying, it's important to be primed to understand the space that you're going to exist in in VR because there's too much of a cognitive dissonance when you put the VR headset on and now I'm in you know some <coughs> disaster um, tourism space right and but I know my body's not there but once you put your body in the space that's similar to your virtual world you can be more convinced and then be, maybe be more mindful once you come out of the experience. Also playing with simulation, you know, like seeing if we could like mirror the simulacra of like, if you're inside of this physical space, which then is, you know, the same as the virtual space. And, you know, I played the voice of one of the characters and Carmen did the mo -ca motion capture of another character. If you can like recognize our movements or our sound when you come out of VR and we're right there waiting for you in the physical space, like did that actually happen? You know, like are you, what, like just kind of playing with like more metaphysical aspects too, which is what we're really interested in for the next version of like thinking about transcendence and ritual and like myth mythology and creating a new American mythology. In the back. Yeah, I was just interested to know how you three came together. You said you've known each other for 14 years and you two went to school together, but how you two came together to like actually decide to do this? All through school, like Carmen and I went to, to undergrad together, um, and then she and Edge did their masters together, um, and then you know, like life kind of happened in between, <laughs> and then we came together in New York and had this idea for a project that we thought was important and timely, um, and so Carmen and Edge started Hyphen Labs uh, right after they finished grad school and had done like a lot of really inspiring and. and impactful work uh, like kinetic sculptures and things like that and I was doing um, brand marketing for a company and like thinking about the, n the neuroscience of decision making so it was like it's kind of one of those things where you're, s you're, you're working at the periphery of all of these things that are your various interests and when we came together it all just kind of clicked um, and when it was also out of this like we by creating, that's a mode of self-care for ourselves. And so there was this devastating kind of tragedy that happened and how are we going to get our, ourselves through it? We weren't gonna sit on the couch and cry, even mm -hmm. though that's what we did for, t for some time, but there was, you know, there was something else we had to do. Um, and so like these young students now, they're organizing um, this like, this was our way of like creating and being like activated in our own realm to hopefully inspire young designers um, to you know take responsibility in their work um, in the algorithms that they make in the products they design in the space that they hold for underrepresented people um, in you know conversations um, and you know change change the way that we interact with each other yeah to really so. be citizens I think you know like use whatever meeting you have to be a citizen in this world and to not be apathetic any more questions that I've missed I know uh, I, I don't see all of you, so I'm trying to make sure that... I think you guys did a, a wonderful job at it, too, so 
one word that you've used before is new narrative. Uh, so I was in Tribeca where your piece was exhibited. I remember very well when you're asking Carles why the before, you know, the installation as a driver. You are waiting in line for other experiences. You see the very popular one or usually a little hidden. And then you see a salon and you're standing around and you're like, wow, this looks really interesting. But not only that, the characters that you guys played also made it, I think, and that's part of, I hope, what you're studying as well. You did feel part of a conversation without even knowing what it was necessarily about because you're already looking at objects, you're starting to think, what does this scarf do? Oh look, it's against surveillance and machine <laughs> vision. Oh wow, so your brain is already starting to get ideas about what this could be. And I think the overall experience personally for me was we're all responsible of reimagining these new narratives. So just getting that feeling out is part of the civic engagement as well. You know, reminding people that we're part of that reimagination. You're helping us with one way of reimagining, but you do feel like there's a team, there's people around it, there's conversation before and after. I, I think the person who took the headset off said, Does, doesn't that feel refreshing? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you feel like you're part of that experience. It's not just a VR headset that you live, you know, for just one person to see. It's something that is more collective. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, very, very interesting. Any last thought before? Right, and it's not just like, oh, that was so cool, that was such a cool experience. I mean, because I've gone through a lot of experiences that were really beautiful, but I've all, but you know, when we first, I mean, I still revisit this one to get myself into that, like, productive s mode, where I'm like, okay, I can do this, you yeah. know? these because we leave you with a message and it's like basically it, you have a blank slate you know you can be anything that you want to be um, and also we leave our, our audience with questions of like who's building the future like this these conversations of futurism and, and what that means like who, who's going to be inhabiting this future is it going to be messy is it going to be you know what be <laughs> like we, we always see these images of it like being pristine or be, being like ultra chaotic but is that really what human nature is like I think we're very chaotic and messy and beautiful and you know like and imaginative and like where how is all of that being translated into this this global and uh, you know, like we used Afrofuturism as a device to tell that story because it was like an art form that is so rich um, and we wanted to learn more about, but it's really a global futurism because really the like ties and borders and boundaries that separate us are collapsing and we're becoming, you know, more of this essence of, of duality and like of, of being one human entity. But we've been delighted to have you. Thank you, guys.